So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So we we'll look at, at the last topic of our semester, that is the solid and liquid state dielectric made material. So I'm not going to go into much mathematics, but I'll give you at the end a document which you can read to see a few examples. Because to understand materials you need to have a good knowledge of physical electronics which you shall not go into so i'll give you a small document which you can try to, to follow and see what kind of things you may be having to deal with when you go into electrical insulation and magnetic materials as well so we'll just go through this now and look at the solid state and liquid state dielectric materials and say the following. We'll start with the liquid state materials and the liquid insulators are principally organic material or organic points and often accompany a solid insulation in the same installation primarily as coolants or impregnation. That is, you can have paper as the solid dielectric and then you improve its properties by immersing it or filling it with uh, with oil, okay, or hydrocarbon oil to make the dielectric strength of that paper um, much better as an insulation material. Okay, that's what we call impregnation. You have heard of um, oil being used in transformers, especially by the KPLC, and this is usually used as cooling material because of the ice guard ice losses that had happened inside the transformers. So desirable properties of a liquid insulator should have the following. One, the electric and impulse strength must be high, where electric or dielectric strength is uh, highest uh, electric field that can be applied in, in the material without the material breaking down or losing or starting to conduct. Impulse is how much you can uh, you can actually, you know, how fast you can raise the electric field through the medium itself. So it should have a low loss factor. That means that it should have very few conduct, um, charge carriers, that is free charge carriers in, it, in itself so that we can have the low losses. Also the damping process that we were looking at in the polarization they should also be low. So high thermal conductivity and specific heat capacity that allows us to, to apply higher voltages across it because we know that as the heat increases or the thermal temperature of the material increases, we start releasing uh, charge carriers just like what we did in physical electronics when we talked of uh, thermal generation of charge carriers by heat. 
and therefore the material will start to conduct and its lo uh, the loss factor will uh, deteriorate and therefore it will start to heat much. So the specific heat capacity, of course, from your physics, you recall it the amount of heat you have to put in a kilo or a given unit mass of the material to raise the temperature by unit degree C or unit Kelvin. So good chemical stability so that if there are issues to do with uh, heat changing the chemical nature of the material, the, this should be difficult to do. That is, the chemical should not change its uh, shape or its form uh, easily. And then gas absorbing properties is because once we have gas absorbed in liquids and the heat started to increase, what would happen is that the liquid may start to boil. And usually when you use oil, even the KPLC oil used in uh, transformers, it's usually first of all treated to try and remove as much dissolved gases from the oil as possible. So it should also have low viscosity and low density, as well as low volatility and low solvent power at high flash points. Flash points being the, the temperature at which the material may combust or break into flames. So low flammability also and toxicity are also in environmental issues that would be available, would be required for such a material. So organic coins are mainly used in transformers and switch gear. Although of us who will be dealing with the high high current uh, options in fifth year, we will have to deal with this kind of uh, switch gear and transformers, so I don't have to go into definitions of what they are going to be. They are used in bushing and cables, capacitors and electronic equipment, and liquid insulation will, be, will change, is changed from time to time in the transformers, because uh, however, the oil change is not possible in the case of seal devices. That is, as your oil uh, ages, it will start to lose its uh, insulation properties and it must be changed. So liquid phase insulation include the following there. Petro petroleum mineral oils and fluorinated liquids synthetic hydrocarbons and organic esters, vegetable oils and silicon uh, fluids, ascarels or chlorinated hydrocarbons, but ascarels are now uh, banned for use because ascarels take a very long time to degrade in the environment and therefore they are an environment issue and therefore they are, they are not uh, allowed in the modern uh, you know, kind of applications. So again, they are also very poisonous in nature, so to speak. So petroleum uh, minerals, mineral oils are naturally occurring mixtures, which consist mainly of hydrocarbons in the liquid state. With petroleum mineral oils can be categorized under one, you have paraffins, you have asphaltics, which are thicker or the mined ones, and Oils will be refined to remove metals and other impurities from after the extraction from the ground. So oils can have dielectric strength between 400 and 500 kilovolts per centimeter in the refined form. And further refining can push this to high, as high as 1,000 kilovolts per centimeter. However, dielectric strengths of oils will fall during use due to a combination of factors, and this include, one, the oil will be aging because as you apply uh, different amounts of electric fields and they are changing their directions, of course, the, they will start to change their chemical form, and therefore, that's what we refer to as aging, as you increase their temperature and so forth, they change their chemical form. So contamination, where we may have small pieces of uh, metal particles or carbonated uh, when it's, uh, we have some kind of carbon being formed and this will contaminate the oil and therefore start to generate regions where we can start to form, uh, you know, 
uh, the conduction channels through the, uh, through the liquid. So most insulating oils will have an epsilon R of about 2.2 and power factors that are below uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 4 at 50 hertz and 20 degrees C, which are the power frequency and normal ambient temperatures, but mainly in Europe. So fluorinated liquids are characterized by high chemical stability, and that's why they were used in the first place, allowing applications to up to temperatures of 200 degrees C. So these have epsilon R of around 1.8 with low loss tangents of less than 5, point, uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 4, and high resistivity, which is usually about 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 18 ohm centimeter. So their cooling properties are better than those of mineral oils and silicones, and the application fields of these liquids are hence in some electronic equipment, such as the radio, uh, electronic system transformers, and, and again, chlorinated fluids suffer degradation through moisture absorption, however, and are to be found primarily in equipment that will be operated in a sealed form that is thematically sealed. Synthetic hydrocarbons have no major advantages over the natural mineral oils apart from the relative ease of guaranteeing their chemical composition. They have applications mainly in smoothing capacitors for DC power, that is the filter capacitors that you have to for smoothing out the DC power, and high pressure gas filled cables for high temperature or for high whatever high tension cables. And esters are useful mainly at high frequencies due to their relatively low dielectric losses and high dielectric constants. And they are useful in high frequency capacitors. Esters, of course, you recall from your organic chemistry are those uh, materials or those hydrocarbons or organic chemicals that usually have a smell, usually based on the benzene ring. So esters are manufactured chemically by reacting acids and alcohols, but, but some will occur naturally in plants, such as the castor oil. So esters have, one, a high moisture absorption capacity, hence they are also to be found mainly in sealed for their devices. The electric constants are in range between 2 and 3.5 at low frequencies, and power factors at 50 hertz will be about 0 0.05, which at least will decrease to about 0 0.001 at 1 megahertz. So we see that these esters have a very poor process, uh, uh, and they have very high dielectric losses for applications. So the vegetable oils may be classified under one, the drying oils from linseed. We have semi-drying oils from corn, cotton seed, soybean, sesame, and sunflower, and non-drying oils from castor, uh, coconut, palm, and, and olive or peanut. The so classification will depend on the, the ease of the oils to form films, resulting from the ease with which they can be oxidized and, and polymerized when they are exposed to air. So from a dielectric point of view, drying on and non-drying oils are important, e.g. the linseed oil used in the formulation of insulation varnishes, the varnish that, that, that is it's, uh, applied as a paint, especially in coils or uh, the copper coils that you have in transformers as well as mortars. We have castor oil, which is used as a plasticizer in insulating resins, compositions employed in the structural insulation materials. We have coating compositions in electrical equipment and ascarins, which are coordinated aromatic benzene based hydrocarbons. Ascarins are also are fire resistant and therefore their use is usually very useful. The chlorination usually brings in this problem of, uh, you know, the ozone layer depletion because of the hydrocarbons that are, you know, chlorinated hydrocarbons causing that kind of uh, issue with the, with the ozone. They react with the ozone in the atmosphere and they have led to the break in the ozone layer 
in the above the atmosphere. So they have been used in transformers and capacitors that require high dielectric constants. And they have fairly high breakdown voltages so in the range of 80 to 180 kilovolts per centimeter and have resistivities in excess of 10 giga ohm centimeter. So they have dielectric constants in the range of 4.8 to 5.3 and power factors in the range of 0 0.02 to 0 0.05. So, however, as currents, we are now recognized as accumulatory persistent ecological contaminants, and their use is now likely discontinued or discouraged. So, the silicon fluids are polyorganic silicons with a unique combination of properties, such as they are clear liquids with an oily consistency and have epsilon R between 2.2 and 2.8, and have viscosities that are very high. Or that vary over a wide range, have high thermal stability at high temperatures, and polyorganic silicons have dielectric properties that are likely independent of frequency and therefore they are usually very nice in electronic systems and temperature, making them excellent coolants in pulsed radar systems. Okay, the radar systems that use pulse uh, rather than continuous wave just use pulses in form of pulses, so to speak, to, to increase the, uh, the power that the radar system can operate at. We have them in aircraft and radio transformers. And silicons are however detrimentally affected by arcing, and hence they will not be suitable for use in switch gear, which are inherent, you know, inherently yeah, whatever affected a lot by arcing. Arcing will always occur, especially when you break the contact. So how do we choose the liquid dielectrics? When choosing a, dielectric, a liquid dielectric, several factors besides their physical properties must be considered, which include, one, the environmental factors, like ascarens. We have said ascarens are not useful because they are not biodegradable and they also have poisonous nature. Then, how the space saving properties, how, how much of it do we need for a particular application? Okay. So, cost and also chemical stability. So, hence, mineral oils remain the dominant liquid insulators in active application to date. So, how do, what are the breakdown mechanisms that occur in liquid state or liquid phase insulators? So the breakdown in liquid insulators is not a well uh, explained phenomenon, but we have some fairly successful theories that have been advanced and these include one, the colloidal theory, the bubble theory, and the breakdown uh, due to liquid globules and the electronic theory as well. So, the, the, when liquids are contaminated with contaminants such as cellulose fibers, these tend to accumulate in, the, in regions of maximum stress. So, they accumulate, the accumulates may then form bridges between the electrodes, which tend to short circuit the electrodes, leading to the eventual breakdown. This is the colloidal theory. So, the bubble theory, however, says that mechanically pure liquids will contain no moisture or any other impurities such as gases. And pure liquids may, however, contain dissolved gases, which tend to collect around the electrodes in the form of bubbles. So, the bubbles, the gas bubbles, may then become ionized and elongated, that is, they are polarized from, polar, uh, from polarization and this may lead to breakdown. So similar bubble theory, uh, to bubble theory, liquid globule theory involves a liquid such as water collecting in the form of globules around the electrodes. And the globule elongates on polarization and this will lead to a breakdown because you can form a chain of the globules between the electrodes. So in the presence of dissolved gases, moisture or other impurities 
high electric stresses will lead to ionization of the molecules and cells. And this may lead to abalone breakdown as energetic ions lead to further ionization of the neutral molecules. So what about the solid state insulating materials? So a wide variety of solids with insulating properties can be classified under the organic, that is paper, cotton, or rubber. We have inorganic, such as mica, glass, silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, plastics, and so forth. So solid state insulators may also be broadly classified under the paper and press boards. We have fibrous materials, which may be oil impregnated or not. We have resins and polymers, filling or bonding materials, natural or synthetic materials as well, and composite materials, which now can borrow from any of these other groups. So all materials will usually experience electric, thermal, and mechanical stress. And the ability of the material to withstand the electrical stress may depend on how well they can withstand other types of stresses. So hence, the limiting temperature at which these materials can be used as insulators must be well established. So solid state insulators will fall under seven categories according to the temperature range in which they are used. And this is what is referred to as thermal stability. One, we have the Y class with a limiting temperature of 90 degrees C and most of these materials will include cotton, silk, copper, rubber, and PVC. PVC, of course, is very uh, ubiquitous today in the form of the electrical cables that we use in electrical wiring in buildings and so forth. Then the class A, which goes to 105 degrees C, and this would be impregnated paper, silicon, cotton, or polyamide resin. Then we have the E class of, at 120 degrees C, with enamel on polyvinyl base or polymethane or epoxy. Then we have the B class, which is like 30. This includes mica, fiberglass, asbestos. Asbestos, of course, we know this is also very, very discouraged nowadays because of the poisonous nature. Asbestos has been found to cause cancer. So mica and fiberglass will be found mainly in electronic uh, devices such as capacitors and PCBs that you use for your fabrication of electrical circuits. So class F at 155 degrees C, we have polyester with epoxide varnish, heat resistant varnish in cables. So the class H, which can operate up to 180 degrees, is again, we can have mica as well, we have fiberglass and also asbestos, which this will be treated maybe to try and improve the temperature from the class B form. And class C, which is uh, operates at the highest temperature of about 2255. And again, we have micas, the ceramics, such as Euroid, and we have the glass and Teflon. Teflon is the same material that would be used in the nonstick pans used in kitchens. Again, Teflon is being discouraged in the use in, uh, in the house as pans because it usually comes off after some time and it has been found to have some kind of health issues. So paper and press boards are made from cellulose fiber of a high degree of purity with wood fiber often constituting the main ingredient. So some important parameters of these insulators will include the thickness and apparent deep density, which affects the dielectric strength, loss, and permeability. So finish and the porosity, and the tensile strength and tearing uh, resistance. Paper insulators are prone to water absorption and are therefore usually impregnated with mineral or vegetable oil to try and keep the, paper, the water out. So this treatment will lend these insulators an epsilon R of approximately three. We have power factors in the range of 0 0.0017 to 0 0.0025, 0 
at densities of 0 0.75 to 1.7 gram per centimeter cube. So a conductivity of 10 to the minus 17 Zeeman per centimeter at 25 degrees C. And the impulse breakdown voltage in papers in has is approximately 3,000 kilovolt per centimeter or 3 gigavolt megavolt per centimeter. So, so paper and principles are usually applied in areas that include winding and cable conductor insulation. We have them as primary dielectric in paper capacitors and transformers. The fibrous materials will combine the strength and durability and therefore are to be found in many applications for which there are a deciding consideration. So fibrous materials include, that is where this, these values, that is strength and durability are the deciding consideration. And this will include cotton and silk. We have synthetic fibers such as jute, the viscous rayons, nylon and fiberglass. And the fibrous materials will, will have properties such as flexibility and easy to process. We have process, uh, they have very high mechanical strength. They are relatively low cost. And these materials will, however, have low dielectric strengths and are highly hygroscopic. That is, they absorb moisture aggressively. Electrical properties can be improved through an oil impregnation to keep up their, to put down their hygroscopic uh, nature. So, the dielectric constants of the fibrous materials will range from about 3 to 8 in a perfectly dry condition, but many of the electric properties uh, would, uh, are frequency dependent, such as epsilon R will decrease with increasing frequency and shows a fair amount of anisotropy. By anisotropy, if you recall, we say that it depends on the direction of application of the fields. Resistivity will decrease with increasing moisture content, and amplification, however, include conductor insulations. We have winding and coil insulations, backing for mica, etc. So, inorganic fibers such as asbestos and fiberglass will withstand high temperatures but have low elasticity or unmachinability. That is, you cannot machine them easily. So, impregnated coating or the filling of the bonding materials. This will, can be classified as waxes. You can have insulating varnishes, the filling and bonding material. And waxes are soft in nature and have low mechanical strength. Remember that waxes, it's more like the beeswax and the lights uh, or paraffin wax. And low mechanical strength, but can be used as impregnating materials or other dielectric materials. So artificial waxes such as paraffin, cerecide, and halo wax will have excellent insulating properties. However, the natural waxes such as beeswax will enjoy limited insulation applications. So insulating varnishes are solutions of resins, bitumen, etc., and are mainly used as impregnating coating and adhesive materials. So bonding materials are used to seal off separately insulated parts, while adhesive tapes are to be found extensively in wiring wax. The resins include natural and synthetic polymers, such as plastics, and these can be classified on the basis of their behavior under thermal stress. So thermoplastic or thermosetting resins and thermoplastic resins can be formed into fibers and will retain their properties after melting and solidification on cooling. So, however, they have low mechanical strength and thermosetting resins lose their properties after heat treatment and have poor insulating properties. So, however, they are good, they have good uh, properties, uh, mechanical properties. 
and the natural stresses will find extensive application and include materials such as the shellac. We have resins themselves and copal or amber. And shellac is obtained from tropical trees and has good adhesive properties. So synthetic uh, resins include polyestrine. We have polyethylene. The polyethylene is used mainly in uh, cable insulation. We have PVC or polyvinyl chloride, which is used today in many of the cables that you are going to work with once you go into building services applications. And acrylic is a bit more expensive. Polyimide, this gives you a better, they are used mainly in, um, in semiconductor industry. As, okay. And resins derived from cellulose, polyester, uh, epoxy resins, and so forth. The rubbers, we can have natural rubber or synthetic rubber. A natural rubber will be a polymer of hydrocarbon isoprene and has poor thermal properties and is prone to oxidation when exposed to air. It has an epsilon R of about 2 to uh, 2.5 to 5 and a low loss tangent of 0 0.01 to 0 0.03. Synthetic rubber includes butadine rubber, we have butyl rubber, and polychloroprene uh, rubber, silicon rubber, and this and fine, this one is not, uh, this is a mistake. So synthetic fiber is used, or a synthetic rubber is used in wiring and aircraft cabling. The inorganic uh, solid state insulators include glass, we have ceramics, ceramics are oxides of metals, which are compacted and fired to high temperatures to fuse. Then we have mica and we have asbestos and they are brittle and hence have poor mechanical strength but can withstand extreme arcing conditions and high temperatures. So the composite materials uh, include are a combination of different materials to take advantage of the positive attributes coming from the constituent materials. And one of the constant materials is usually laminated with another of superior and pertinent properties. So examples would include one asbestos polyethylene fiber, have asbestos paper polyethylene resin, and in general, the composite and organic materials are more widely used as insulating materials. So how does breakdown occur in the solid state uh, insulators? Breakdown in solids may be caused by several factors, and this may include one, defects and material inhomogeneities. That is, we may have areas where we have, say, meat holes in the inside of the whatever, or cavities in the material, or where we will have uh, the material not being consistent or consistent density. Yeah? We may it will also be size and the shape of the specimen that you are going to use as an insulator is also an issue. We have surface conditions, how rough or smooth they are, because we know that when we have cavities, of course, we may start having air, uh, regions where we have a thick air, and these air regions will have a low dielectric constant, of course, our uh, dielectric set, of course. So duration of the applied electric stress and the moisture, moisture and other contaminant contamination levels. So several breakdown mechanisms can be identified and this includes one intrinsic breakdown, we have what we call thermal breakdown and discharge breakdown, chemical and electrochemical breakdown. Tracking and as in the intrinsic breakdown now we'll go into it a little bit and say that it will occur mainly due to impurities because of the perfect electrics have no free electrons. So if you have impurities which will give you free charge carriers, the charge carriers will be accelerated in the high electric fields that you, the insulators are normally going to be operated at. And when they get sufficient kinetic energy, they can collide with the solid atoms 
and ionize them, thereby increasing the free carrier concentration in an avalanche process, and that will lead to breakdown. In the absence, in the presence of impurities, the associated electron, free electrons can cause generation of secondary ele electrons at high temperatures, rendering an otherwise good insulator to conduct appreciably. So breakdown hence will occur at lower voltages as the level of impurities increases in the material. So the dielectric strength of an insulator hence decreases with the in the increasing temperature and degree of contamination. So thermal breakdown occurs due to thermal degeneration caused by heating arising from the dielectric process. So thermal stability is achieved when the heat generation rate is equal to the rate of heat dissipation into the environment. That is how much you are taking the heat away from the insulator. So a critical temperature can be defined below which thermal stability will be attained and above which the insulator thermally collapses. Because once it starts to collapse, of course, there will be what you call thermal runaway that you covered in third year uh, electronic uh, analog electronic studies. So the electric loss is dependent on the applied voltage stress and hence thermal breakdown voltage is usually specified in, in the description of the dielectric. So curves highlighting the critical temperature for insulators are, or may have the following shape. That is we have the Q3, Q2, Q1, these are the rates of heat conduction or heat dissipated and the heat generated, so to speak. So this is the heat dissipated out uh, and this will be the heat generated within the, the insulator at different voltages, V3, V2 and V1. So we note that thermal stability will be realized only for the voltage V1, okay? That is this voltage here, we can have thermal uh, stability. So, this charge breakdown is usually caused by the presence of cavities, which lead to high field intensities, creating partial discharges. We know that when you have a dielectric, the dielectric will, uh, the field in the dielectric will be smaller than the field in the cavity itself. And therefore, as you increase the field in the dielectric, the field in the cavity will also increase and it may reach a high, the, the critical of the, the dielectric strength of the gas inside that cavity, which is normally air. And that will break down and the flash may cause uh, the heat or the temperature of the dielectric to increase. And if it's a flammable uh, dielectric solid, it may start to oxidize as well. So we consider an electric field intensity in the cavity shown as here. So we have a cavity in the form of a cylindrical cavity, okay? And here the rest is the solid. And this is placed in a parallel plate capacitor. And therefore we can model this in terms of the, the body capacitor. And we have also the, the CM and the CC which are the values of the cavity and the, the rest of the material, the dielectric material. So the voltage VC across the cavity can be expressed as the VC equal to CM by CM plus CC VA. And you can see that this is going to be the epsilon R of the material divided by the epsilon R of the material minus one minus TM by tau C, which are the thicknesses of the or the dimensions of the cavity itself multiplied by the applied voltage. And we see that this is just going to be one divided by that. So and hence, the critical electric field EC is going to be given, by, and that is the electric field inside the cavity is going to be given by the voltage in the cavity divided by the length of that cavity. And this gives us a value of V divided by tau C, TC. So this significantly will be significantly higher than the VA divided by TM and will hence cause partial discharge inside the cavity. So the accumulated effect is to heat up the material gradually until there will be 
a total breakdown in the end. So the life of the material is internal discharges will therefore depend on the number of cycles of the electric field has been applied to the material. Chemical breakdown is related to thermal breakdown and the material gradually changes its chemical composition as temperature is maintained, resulting in the eventual breakdown. So chemical breakdown is progressive and occurs even when no stress is applied. So the reason for this may lie in oxidation, moisture, temperature, or contamination. And ions release gases that contaminate the electrode and should and could be harmful as well. So this the tracking itself refers to the formation of permanent conducting paths across the surface of the of the insulation. So a film may be formed on the insulator surface from one moisture, two, we can have carbonaceous dust, dust that is coming from the dust in the environment, industrial deposits, or we can have cellulose fiber for the money. So sparking may occur when this film dries up and separates. Tracking can occur at low voltages of less than 100 of approximately 100 volts, but can be suppressed by good surface cleaning. If you walk around, you'll see most of the time the insulation, the glass insulation on power cables is usually dusty. Sometimes it may be dusty. Usually the, the cleaning is done by, by the environment whenever we have rain and so forth. Okay, and therefore tracking that's our family. And this brings us to the end of that particular topic. It's a short one, and we've just given you just a talk about it. Like I said, I uh, once I prepare the the actual electric uh, the field theory of the breakdown of, of the dielectric materials, I'll arrange this in the shared drive. But for now, this is as far as we'll go with the solid state dielectrics. And you shall be those ones will be dealing with high tension or high current options may are going to find uh, to work with the insulators anyway and they'll have to get a few a little bit more material. For us, what we have talked about is good enough. You already know the electric properties of the dielectrics where we have used it in the say for example in the cables in the definition of the characteristic impedance and propagation issues those ones will be good for us at this particular time so any question then? Does it mean uh, more than not? No question. We don't have any questions. So I'll stop there for now. I, now we can you can give uh, if you have any issues, you have like uh, problems that you have uh, with the material that is already given. You can give it now. Otherwise, uh, from next week we shall just be looking at tutorial problems. I've given you quite a number of tutorial problems to work. I don't know whether you have worked through them. Remember in the tutorial class, I'm not going to be doing the anticipation of what problems you may have. It's I'll depend mainly on you to tell me where you have issues. So I don't know whether you want us to, we, our class today is about two hours. We have just done uh, almost just uh, about three quarters of an hour so i don't know whether you want to take a break and we meet next week or you want us to continue with the with the, in the next hour with any of the problems that you have it's your it's up to you i stand to be directed by yourselves today I propose mm -hmm. uh, we break today and then uh, we resume next week when we shall have gone through most of the tutorials. Okay, that, that is fine. Anybody else with a contrary opinion?
Do anyone need a contrary opinion? No? Okay then, I wish you then a good weekend. Try and keep safe. Okay, from this COVID thing. And don't, don't go meeting guys coming from India right now. I understand they have a terrible one. So, okay, fine. Do have a nice weekend and let's meet next week. Yeah, nice weekend to you as well. Thank you.